Okay, since this morning we looked into the life of the Prophet Muhammad and in the second session we're going to do very much the same but what I want to do in the second session is, is we're going to look at the transmissional history of the Quran itself and then what we will do is, is we will also look at some of the sources of the Prophet, the Hadith, the Sunnah and some of the Sirat literature and what we're going to do is, is we're going to ask certain fair questions surrounding the Prophet of Islam. Uh, Muhammad obviously we already mentioned uh, at this stage when we look at the life of Muhammad, when he becomes a prophet of the nation of Arabia, uh, he unifies Arabia into a single religious uh, 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 policy uh, or party uh, uh, that is obviously under the rule and reign of Islam. Uh, when we look at uh, the life of Muhammad, we also need to exert and we also need to tell people about the positive influences and we're going to look at that. Uh, a lot of times, when we do Muslim evangelism, a lot of people, uh, uh, they quite, especially when they listen to me and John, we do not just focus on the negatives of Muhammad, but we also show what really contributed to this peninsula and to the people that they held onto him. So uh, when we look at the life of Muhammad, we looked at different areas, but th for the sake of this conversation, uh, we're going to look at the pre the, uh, the immigration uh, in Mecca, which is from 570 to about 622 CE. And then we can look at post Hijra, which is in Medina from 622 until 632. So we're going to cover a lot of aspects of traditional Islam and its biographies. So if you're unfamiliar with this, please be reminded that some of the material is already uploaded. It's already on the page. It will be uploaded and you're welcome to use it uh, as it is seen fit. What I will also do is, is I will send her, Class Captain Lazan, I'll send her, uh, again, like I said, a copy of the study Quran on PDF and Gordon Nichols' new book uh, that is a commentary on the Quran for absolutely for free. She'll send it to you guys. So if you have to do assignments, if you ever want to read a little bit further on some of these documents, you have it readily available in, uh, in your library as well. Okay? Uh, so I'll, I'll send that to you. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to start uh, again, like I said, we look at um, previously at some of the influences on the prophet. We said that there's definitely a supernatural influence. We can see quite clearly that that influence is perceived by the prophet himself very early on as being demonic. Uh, that should be a concern for us and we ask a lot of questions surrounding that. I've not covered the satanic verses where the prophet later in his life and in his uh, pursuit of his prophethood is dissuaded by sorcery and witchcraft. That is then the uh, hadith as well. Uh, but very early on, the prophet, in actual fact, made certain claims to revelation that would include these different gods uh, and uh, almost redeem these individuals from their right not to draw upon them. Uh, that is problematic and it's recanted and Muhammad changes it. Gabriel obviously comes to him and says to him, why did you speak these falsehoods? And the prophet then uh, recants from that. But when we start with the prophet, we need a good foundation, a solid foundation uh, that uh, we can learn from uh, when we engage with the prophet of Islam. So uh, I'm going to uh, speak about some of the sources that speak on the prophet of Islam. We're going to specifically look at the hadith and some of the narratives that have been constructed surrounding the life of the prophet. So when we start with the sources of the prophet, traditionally, the word hadith, uh, and you can usually, hadith is just a collection, uh, which is a plural, and then a hadith can speak to a specific rendition. But it means a communication or a narrative uh, in an Islamic setting. And in these narratives, there are certain stories uh, that is obviously given about the life of the Prophet and his companions. Um, and uh, in his book, uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Qadir, uh, writes the following, he wrote a book called Islam Explained uh, and he says apart from the Quran there's another book that Muslims rely on for guidance, the Hadith which contains the words and deeds of the Prophet. The Islamic law and the teachings of Islam are formulated mainly from the Quran and the Hadith. The Quran contains the exact words of God while the Hadith contains the words and the conduct of the Prophet Muhammad. The product or the conduct of the Prophet is called the Sunnah. Uh, it is from the Sunnah that Muslims learn uh, uh, many practical applications of the Quran. And later on in the end, uh, when we look at the good, the bad and the ugly of the Prophet, uh, I'm going to show you just quickly what influence the estimation of the Prophet had on Islam and its adherents. And uh, obviously we've seen some of the influences that were ugly, uh, especially recently in Mozambique where 50 people were decapitated, it's right next to us, uh, because of the very belief in what the Prophet and, and the Sunnah have said. So all of these things need to be accounted for. 
uh, and all of these things we need to look at. Okay, Ignaz Galdazir, who is a Muslim polemi uh, a Christian polemicist, he mentions that even amongst the heathen Arabs, uh, it was virtuous to follow the sunnah or way of life of one's forefathers to determine uh, acceptability in a given uh, Islamic or pre-Islamic society. Uh, we see this, uh, therefore, in the post-pagan people that uh, obviously they could not, because of Islam, contain or maintain their pagan way of life. And the Muslim community in and of itself imitated the conduct and the example of the Prophet and his companions as a model to the affairs of their everyday life. Now, if you've read through the Hadith and the Sunnah of the Prophet, you'll see that that is basically problematic, and we're going to look at some of the things that have been made problematic in due time. So, the first community of the Prophet is called the Sahabi, uh, and we can see that it is a society uh, that lived under the constitutes of the Divine Prophet, and therefore Muslim deem, uh, Muslims deem them to be uh, authoritative and knowing uh, the way of the Prophet, or the Sunnah of the Prophet, or the example of the revered Prophet. And Muslims get their proximity from these accounts of these individuals that have lived in the time uh, of the Prophet, and especially from the Hadith and the Sunnah. Uh, Sheikh Qadir, in his book, uh, explained, and he says the following. He says, the Sunnah and the words of the Prophet, as recorded in the Hadith, serve as a practical guide and explanation to the correct understanding of the principles set out in the Quran. So, you need to understand, Muslims don't just look at the Quran to give proximity to their faith. The reason they venerate the Prophet of Islam so much is because they believe that the Prophet of Islam exemplifies the will of Allah for all mankind. So the way in which the Prophet deals with certain social institutions, the way the Prophet of Islam deals with certain uh, predicates found within human society, he is seen as the perfect example. And again, uh, we will see that. Another scholar, uh, in actual fact, uh, writes the following uh, about the Prophet's conduct. Um, and he says uh, the following about the Prophet. He says, the Prophet was the Holy Quran personified. Now, not like we believe the Word became flesh and he dwelled amongst ordinary men and the Word was God, as the, uh, the, the Gospel of John says. No, they believe that the conduct of the Prophet is perfectly exemplified and that which he received is obviously given to the community, but the lifestyle of the Prophet is to be emulated. Um, and again, like I said, for Christians, obviously, we afford our devotion to the, to the perfect man, the perfect mediator, before God and man, the person Jesus Christ, uh, as we see it in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. So, we can see quite clearly that um, for Muslims, the prophet, uh, Muhammad, uh, six centuries after Christ, would be the most revered example that will be venerated, but not worshipped. Okay? Um, and again, this is problematic because when we look at the Prophet Muhammad, uh, in some of the Hadith literature, he's venerated to such a degree uh, that he is afforded uh, intermediaryship. You can pray to him in certain instances. He's the one that bestows blessing upon the Ummah. He is seen as a mediary. But uh, the Bible tells us, and Paul tells us quite clearly in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, that there's only one mediator before God, a man, the man Christ Jesus. So there's this tension between Christianity and uh, between uh, Muslims, where Muslims will accept Isa ben Miriam, and they will say that Jesus is venerated and seen as a great man in the Quran, but he's not to be worshipped, where we say, no, no, he's the perfect man, he is the sufficient man, and uh, he is ultimately the one that we should follow. He's the perfect example. Even the Quran speaks of Jesus' sinlessness, of his endless perfection, and we can see in the Quran it speaks more of Muhammad's faults, and it does not deny that Muhammad was fallible. So for us, obviously, just a little precursor, Jesus is seen as being superior in all things. So as the traditions relate, the prophet's estimation of himself uh, is of high importance. We read the following, for instance, narrated by Abu Huraira. Uh, Abu Huraira obviously speaks in Sal Bukhari, book uh, 3535, book 16, hadith number 44. And listen to the prophet's estimation of himself. This is very important, and I'll repeat some other things as well. Allah's messenger said, my similitude in comparison with the other prophets before me is that of a man who was built a house nicely and beautifully except for the place uh, of one brick in a corner. People go about it and wonder, uh, and wonder at its beauty but say, 
would that, would that this brick be put in this place? So I am that final brick or that brick. I am the last of the prophets. So he is seen, and Muslims will speak when they look at Muhammad, as the seal of the prophets. He came to finally speak authoritatively on God's behalf. And in some instance, uh, instances, Muslims would say that Muhammad was the ultimate correction to all world faiths. That there's some estimation of truth in all world religions, but especially in Christianity. Christians are called back from their polytheism, they're called back from the understanding of the, the tritheistic God, and they're called to give glory only to Allah alone and not to Jesus and Mary. We will look at that uh, again on Thursday. Um, and we've got an interesting conversation of that. So the prophet's estimation of himself is that he's the last of the prophets. As for the prophet uh, being a perfect example for his people, uh, we see once more in uh, Surah Al-Azab, that's chapter 33, verse 21, uh, we see the following being said. And this is the prophet, obviously speaking, under divine inspiration. Uh, Allah speaks to the prophet and he says, Certainly you have an excellent model in the messenger of Allah for one who hopes to meet Allah and the last day and who remembers Allah again and again. So Muhammad is elevated to a stature in a place where he is ultimately venerated to such a degree that uh, he is the perfect example. Uh, again, in his uh, recorded last sermon, uh, the prophet of Islam uh, announced the importance of both the hadith and the sunnah. Uh, and this is important because we've got a movement, and we'll quickly shortly look at that, uh, a, a group of people that have founded uh, an organization where they're against the Hadith. They call themselves the Qurani Onlys, uh, and we will look at that shortly. But listen to what uh, the Prophet says uh, in Al Marwati uh, in 1661. Uh, the Prophet is recorded to say the following, I've left you with two matters which will never lead you astray, as long as you hold to them the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Prophet. So Muhammad says, if you want to know my example, I've left you the example of these books. Now, interestingly enough, uh, just to play a little bit of a devil's advocate, uh, the, the compilation of the Hadith was two to three hundred years after uh, Muhammad. So who compiled it and who says the Prophet said it? Uh, and so there's a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of, uh, a lot of claims made, uh, which Muslims are very charitable when it comes to their own sources and when it comes to Christianity, uh, they would level against us as being problematic for Christians. So just keep that in mind that if you want to know anything about the Prophet of Islam, uh, obviously these sources are readily available. Um, they are easily accessible uh, and you can read a lot about them on different websites. So let's look at the biographies. Uh, there are uh, three important components to notice when we look at the Hadith and the Hadith literature. Uh, first of all, we need to look at the sequence of the reporters. Uh, Muslims will speak of the Isnat, uh, through which the accounts have spread. Uh, that is very important for Muslims when they look at the validity of all of these hadith. Secondly is the introductory text. They will speak of the Taraf, uh, and they will say uh, by the Taraf, uh, it characterizes the actions and characteristics of the, of the Prophet in a given context. And lastly, when we look at the Hadith, another uh, thing to uh, notice is the text of the Hadith or the speech recorded uh, that introduces the, the matan or, or the instruction uh, that is given to believers through the life of the Prophet. So uh, the Hadith is ordered in different variations to show uh, the, the authority of some and uh, a lesser authority of others. When we speak about Sai, we speak about sound hadith, uh, and hadith uh, that is sai is usually uh, reported to be dependable. Uh, the reporter is known for his truthfulness, for his knowledge, and the correct way of accounting for the narrative. Um, so uh, a Muslim uh, scholar by the name of Abdul uh, Siddiqui mentions that this hadith, which is deemed to be sahih, uh, in actual fact is absolutely faultless. So you've got Sahi, then you've got a lower quality Hadith, which is seen as Hassan, uh, which is approved. But when we look at Hassan, the, this is a Hadith whose uh, reporters are known and have a, a solid character, but sometimes these individual people have what is known as a weak memory. So they'll say, yes, this Hadith is being said, uh, but maybe the author you know, has a weak memory of what was said. Uh, the next point of Hadith, which is again a lower quality from Hassan, is what is known as Da'if. Da'if 
uh, and this is weak, okay? Uh, usually, whatever gets them in hot water is daif. It is so weak. If it says something about the uh, supposed prophet that seems to be in contradiction of Islam, it quickly becomes daif. Uh, but how do they determine if something is weak? Well, this is hadith rank under that which is known as the sun, which is obviously under that which is uh, good. But because of its uh, shortcomings and it's not, the sequence uh, of the report is obviously is seen as being weak in and of itself and therefore it should not be deemed to be authoritative as would be a sahih. Uh, uh, hadith. Uh, another one uh, is called a uh, mutawatir. Uh, this means ongoing or continuous and this hadith that reports uh, uh, and is reported by such many rightful companions uh, that it is agreed upon as being authentic. So we've got a lot of teachings for instance on the imperatives of prayer which is evident in the hadith which is mentioned in both Bukhari, Muslim, uh, Ibn Sa'd and all of the rest, Ibn Dawood and all of the other da uh, uh, hadith which would be seen to be authoritative and because it's mentioned all over the place obviously it makes it more assured. For me personally I think that is fair. Uh, I think when we look at some of the Mutawatir hadith uh, it accounts very much so for the multiple voice, multiple attestation uh, of what the Prophet has said and it should be counted and deemed to be authoritative. Uh, another level of hadith then is mashur, uh, which is uh, called famous or known. Um, and this is uh, again something that is related by more than one or two individuals from a specific generation but it seemed authoritative because it's evident in all of these recensions. Uh, another level of hadith is called the Maudu, uh, and uh, this is actually quite fascinating. I've had Muslims many times says that, say that a lot of the hadith later on, um, you know, were invented and it was fabrications. Uh, and I, I think a lot of work needs to be done with uh, a lot of the stories that we find in the hadith, which is deemed to be uh, Maudu. Uh, and the reason is simply because I think there's a lot that was invented on the life of the Prophet. For instance, the life of the Prophet bears no explicit miracles. But we find in later hadith that some miracles have been attributed to Muhammad, him splitting the moon in half uh, and quite a few others, where even Muhammad himself have said in earlier hadith that he performed no miracle as such, but the writing of the Quran itself. And we've shown in the previous session that the, more, that the Quran in and of itself uh, does not really bear such a significant or divine imperatives as, uh, as they would, fall, uh, would think. So Maldu, uh, its meaning is fabricated. Um, and then there is the, the, the Muta, muta uh, Fak Alai, uh, which is basically agreed upon. Uh, in other words, um, both in Imam Bukhari, which is Sai, and both in Imam Muslim, which is also seen as Sai, Two authoritative hadith which speaks on the same situation, giving the same context and giving the same outcome. Uh, that is usually seen as being authoritative um, and it should be deemed to be authoritative in and of itself. For the sake of time, I will definitely not show you all the divisions in Islam. Uh, maybe this is for a little bit further study. But there are certain divisions in Islam that use different hadith. Uh, especially when it comes to the life and the ministry of the Prophet. We know, for instance, that uh, amongst, uh, and we will look at this, uh, we can see in the most significant proportion of Islam, this is Sunni Islam, uh, they give six books that they place in high estimation. That is Sal Bukhari, Sal Muslim, uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, uh, Jami al Tirmidhi, uh, Al Sunan al Surga, and the Sunan Ibn Majah. All of these are seen by the Sunnis to be authoritative, uh, and they see this as being absolutely uh, authoritative for them to know about the Prophet. Uh, in other schools of Sunni Islam, for even uh, you know, in the Madabs, uh, we can see that they reject, for, for instance, Ibn Majah. They say that he's problematic. Uh, they will, for instance, only affirm another outside source in Hadith, the Muwatta Imam Malik, uh, and uh, the Ahmadiyya sect will rely on the Sunni canons as well. Uh, the second largest Muslim sect, uh, by the name of the Shias, they will hold to the four collections of Hadith, which is known as the Kitab al Kafi. The Manla Yaduruhu al Faki, the Tanwil al Ankam, and the Al East Bazar. Weird word, but they will hold to a total different collection of hadith to ascribe authority to the life of uh, the Muslim community. It is also interesting to notice that Muhammad made a prediction uh, that there will be um, 
73 sects in Muslim community. Um, so we, we always like to think that, well, Islam is one entity with one set of beliefs. It is not true. There is 73 different sects. And even in the Hadith, um, we can see quite clearly by Sal Bukhari, uh, he says that, know that Allah's messenger uh, said, my Ummah will divide into 73 sects. All of them will be in the fire except for one. Uh, so there's a lot of infighting as to who is the true uh, Muslims uh, when it comes to that. But yes, there are different sects. In actual fact, I think last time we counted, there's more than 73 sects uh, that we can account for. So it is not uh, an a, uh, entity that is one whole. There's definitely different interpretations, different hadith, and also different ways of life when it comes to the interpretation of all of these different teachings. So uh, it is very important also uh, just to recognize that while uh, there are some Muslims that hold onto the hadith, that there is a new movement where Muslims are now uh, rejecting the hadith completely. And uh, there is Muslims that is known as the Al Al Quran, uh, or the Quran Nayim, or the Quranist. Uh, that completely reject the hadith in and of itself. Um, this is obviously, um, it's got a lot of bearing on the way in which Muslims articulate their understanding of the life of Muhammad. Uh, and um, uh, Aisha Musa from the Florida International University says the following, and I just want to read this to you. She says, there are two strains of oppositions to the authority of the hadith. The first opposition to an extra Quranic source of scriptural authority and the second is to the problematic context of some of the hadith that make the religion an object of ridicule. So what happened is there's a lot of pro problematic hadith. Uh, I've read from some of them this morning. Uh, we, we're still going to read uh, a lot of them this, this afternoon. Um, and she's saying that because of them being problematic, there's a lot of individuals that rather not want to deal with them and reject them completely on the basis that they've been fabricated later, then rather to accept them and to deal with them in their given context. So she says there's one that uh, obviously reject them as because the, it's seen as an object of ridicule. And she says authenticity is also a concern and opponents of the Hadith often argue that the Hadith has nothing to do with the Prophet. However, the overriding concern is about granting scriptural authority to something other than the Quran. That's very important. And why are we saying this? Well, uh, we will see, and I will quickly show you uh, what Muslims get from the Hadith that is not in the Quran. But let me just say that, um, you know, it is important to notice that without the Hadith, uh, even Christians can see quite clearly that the Quran will be without any clear proxy. It will be hard to make sense of what is going on in the Quran in its given context without the context of the Hadith. Uh, Dr. Ikhmat Hamdeh, um, he's actually assistant professor of Arabic and Islamics at uh, MB Radal University. Listen to what he says. He says the Sunnah is necessary in order to uphold the Quran as meaningful text. Texts do not speak for themselves and readers always provide context and bring their assumptions to the understanding of the text. The Sunnah is meant to provide context to the Quran to ensure it's interpret uh, within its certain boundaries. Without it, the Quran would be decontextualized, vague and meaningless. I agree. When one encounters any text, there is a process of interpretation that takes place. And this is no different from the Quran. Extra Quranic sources are necessary to understand the Quran. If the Quran is stripped of all context, it becomes a text that is full of vague meanings. Okay, so this is very important because you've got two options as a Muslim. Or you have to deal with the problematic hadith, or you have to reject it outright. But in rejecting it, you actually reject all of your religion and what is known about the Prophet. So I agree with the sentiments of the scholar Anur Majid when he says that the hadith have become such an integral part of Islam that one cannot make sense of the Quran without the hadith, which is of course a major problem. Now why is the hadith so important for Muslim life and for Muslim ministry? Well, Christians need to understand that the critical five pillars of Islam, and John will discuss this a little bit in more detail tomorrow, that every Muslim tries to adhere to, uh, these include the Shahada, 
which is the Muslim confession of faith. So if you become a Muslim, you'll say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al Rasul Allah. So you'll say that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his final prophet. In saying that, obviously, in a profession of faith, you become a Muslim. Well, that's not found in the Quran. That's found in the Hadith. The five daily prayers that Muslims adhere to, that is not in the Quran. That is stipulated emphatically in the Hadith. Okay, giving to the poor, that is zakat, that's one of the key principles and pillars of Islam. Being good to the poor, going on pilgrimage, so hajj. Hajj is stipulated not in the Quran, it is stipulated in the Hadith. Okay, strict fasting in the month of Ramadan. All these demands do not stem from the Quran, but it's rather stem from the Hadith. So if Muslims reject the Hadith, they've got no proximity for how they practice their faith. And so the Hadith and the Sunnah of the Prophet is very important. And without the Hadith, Muslims might find themselves bankrupt, pointing to their revered Prophet's proposed demands. Okay? So, how do we know, in actual fact, that the Hadith is authoritative? We can only rely on what Muslims have said about it. Now, in and of itself, there is a study. Uh, you can go into Hadith studies and to, to the science of hadith, and, and there's a huge science that Muslims uh, study and that they utilize to determine what is authoritative and what is not. But let me say to you, there's a lot of problems for Muslims that reject certain hadith and uphold others. And therefore, if you look at some of the conversations between the different hadith that is used between the Shia and Sunni Muslims, uh, you'll discover a wealth of knowledge on how they criticize each other. Okay? So it's very important to understand this. Okay, I want to share uh, a little bit, uh, just a little bit more on shift gears. And like in the first session, look now uh, at a short history of the historicity of the Quran. How did Muslims get the Quran? Because as we know, Muhammad did not in any way or form compile the Quran fully. And before his death, he didn't take the book to the rest of the community and say, here you go, here's the book that I've written, and this is authoritative, and follow this. No, Muhammad vastly uh, dependent on oral formaic tradition. He repeated these sayings to his community, and he would repeat it often, so that these individuals would understand his teaching, uh, and also memorize what he has said. Obviously, the Ummah, or the people of the community, uh, this Subana, uh, these people obviously together, held in esteem what Muhammad said, repeated it, and memorized it. But there are certain problems. And let me start off with Surah 59. Uh, and in the Quran, it proclaims the following. Uh, it says, we have without doubt, send down the message. This is Allah speaking. And we will assuredly guard it from corruption. So uh, we can see quite clearly that in Surah 59, the promise is made by Allah uh, that he will preserve his revelation. Uh, but again, I'm going to show you that this is simply not true. Uh, because you minister to Muslims and you need to know this. When we look at a short transmissional history of Islam, we can see that Muslim scholars interpret, uh, again, this verse that I've just read, as a divine promise that the text of the Quran would be preserved perfectly. And only recently, uh, there was an online discussion by uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi uh, and another Muslim, and he made it known, he said, there are certain instances in the text that, that is difficult and hard to explain. And people need to account for this. Uh, just recently, uh, Daniel Brubaker uh, revealed a few uh, mistakes within the Quran and variants within the Quranic manuscript. So you've got the Sa'anna and you've got some of the oldest Quranic manuscripts. And when you collate them, when you, when you put them together, like Christians would do in textual criticism, uh, and uh, when we put these manuscripts together, we find that there are different readings, different spelling, different variants of, of words, etc., uh, etc. Et so the, the idea of perfect preservation of the Quran is simply an idolized myth. Uh, and this is very important. Whenever you speak to Muslims about the Quran, uh, we need to show them in great detail that when we look at the origins of the Quran, first of all, the Quran promises, Surah 59 promises quite outright and clearly that there would be a stamp of Allah's approval, but it will be perfectly preserved. Uh, well, when we read uh, just the, um, the Hadith, and again, the Hadith in and of itself is a wonderful place to start when you deal with Muslims because you deal with their authoritative books. Uh, we can see quite clearly that there are a few problems. Uh, 
So the first Quranic revelation came to Muhammad, uh, people believe around 610. Muhammad delivered more, many, uh, many more various uh, verses to his scribes and to his companions for memorization. Uh, and it was recorded for over the next two decades. Um, and when we look at some of these individuals, they would write some of the revelations down on uh, stalks of palm trees, bones of dead animals, especially uh, camels, flat stones, and, and simply on other materials. But it's important to note that there was no complete manuscript of the Quran during Muhammad's time. And this is important, okay? Because only afterwards did they try to compile uh, the teachings of or the revelations of Muhammad. And here it is very problematic. So obviously the Quranic uh, revelation ceased at the death of the uh, Prophet. And shortly after uh, the Prophet Muhammad's death, uh, the, the Caliph or the one that was uh, Muhammad's closest friend was appointed as the leader or the Caliph of the Muslim Ummah. Uh, and obviously there was a great rebellion because who's now going to be the next leader? Who's next in line? Is it going to be Ali? Is it going to be Muhammad's uh, progeny? Is it going to be somebody that's a leader in the community? Uh, and so there was a lot of uh, riots. But we can see quite clearly that the concern was to preserve the revelation of the Apostle. Um, so we can see quite clearly there's a battle, uh, the battle of Yamama. Uh, don't tell mama, Muslims your, your mama, it's Yamama, just saying. Uh, and uh, we can see that there's a lot of the individual hafuz, uh, of hufaz, uh, people that would memorize uh, the, the portions of the Quran that died at this battle. Uh, and I'm going to show you quite clearly uh, that um, the Muslim sources tell us that some of the revelations that were given by Muhammad was lost because these individuals uh, held the revelations in and of themselves they memorized it and then at the battle of Yamama okay they died and guess what the revelations they held was lost ultimately as well so uh, let me read to you from Ibn Abu Dawood um, in his Kitab al Masahif uh, and listen to it it says the following many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those that survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, this is, these are simply the companions of the Prophet, or Uthman by that time, collect the Quran, nor were they found even with one person after them. So you see, in the Muslim understanding, there is the... Uh, Prophecy given in Surah 59 that the Quran will be completely preserved and it will be kept intact. But the sources, the hadith, tell us that some of the hadith was lost. Uh, and it gets worse. I wish I could stop there, but it gets worse. And I'm going to share this with you. Abu Bakr decided, obviously, as the Caliph, that it was time uh, to gather what remained uh, in the Quranic uh, revelation. And he appointed uh, uh, Zaid ibn Tabid to do this task young man in the community, and after Zayd completed his codex, and that was around 634, 635 Anno Domini, after the death of Muhammad. Uh, after he completed this compilation, it remained in Abu Bakr's possession until his death. Uh, and when it was passed down to Caliph, the next leader, which was Umar, uh, and then when Umar died, it was given to Hafsa, uh, which is a widow of Muhammad. Uh, and uh, again, Sal Bukhari, some of the sources obviously give greater detail of this. But during uh, Caliph Uthman's reign, uh, this is approximately 19 years after the life of the Prophet, well, after his death, uh, there is certain disputes that we recognize that, that arose and a lot of accusations that are made that some of these recensions or revelations that were given were not correct. Uh, and so Uthman ordered that Hafsa's copy of the Quran along with all the known textual materials, all these things that were written down, uh, that it should be gathered together and that an official version should be compiled and that which is left, that that should be burned. Okay, so guess what? All these different uh, readings of the Quran, uh, and the Muslims will today speak of different aruf, uh, they will predominantly speak of, of seven different readings of the Quran, uh, very early on, there's already people saying, wait, no, that's not what the revelation said. Muhammad said it this way. He said it that way. And uh, here we can see that Uthman, under his reign, or the Hafs, that Hafsa's collection be brought together, that there will be uh, a standardized version of the Quran, and that the rest would be burned so there's no confusion. 
So uh, Zaid ibn Tabut and Abdullah bin al Zubair and, and Said bin al As and Abdul Rahman bin Harit, uh, these individuals worked diligently to construct a revised text of the Quran. Uh, and so when this revised text of the Quran compilation was finished, it was sent uh, again to all the different provinces. So this is what Sal Bukhari says about, and this is wonderful, this isn't Sal Bukhari, so listen. Uthman sent to every Muslim province, uh, province one copy of what they had copied and ordered it all the other Quranic materials, whether written or in fragmentary manuscripts or in all copies, that those be burned. Uh, so how do we know? You know, Muslims usually level an accusation against Christians. You don't have the original copies of the Gospels, so it should not be deemed authoritative. Well, you don't have the original copies of the Quran either. Okay, so let's just be uh, fair about this. But yes, that is exactly what happens, and this is what Sal Bukhari mentions. They collect all of these outside evidence after these standardized texts, and they burn that. So the Quran we have today uh, is supposedly descendants uh, from the Uthmanic context or codex. Um, and that is very important for us to understand. So first of all, when we look at the short uh, history of the Quran, we can see quite clearly that there were early disputes about the companionships and about the interpretation of the Quranic text. But let me give you a bit of detail surrounding some of these stirrings that we find very early on. And we're going to only use Muslim uh, sources. We're only going to use uh, the Hadith and uh, Muslim sources. So, like I said, very early on, when the standardization of this text is given, we can see that not all Muslims approved of this new revelation or this new standardized Quran as it was given uh, ultimately by Uthman. So, indeed, some of Muhammad's top teachers uh, rejected the first version, and we can see quite clearly uh, that Muhammad, first of all, uh, interestingly enough, uh, just before his death, he mentions that there are a few individuals that you can take his revelation from. He says, if you listen to these individuals, whatever they say, that is what I've said. You can deem them to be authoritative. they saying the right thing. And let me read you the hadith. Uh, it says the following in, in Sal Bukhari uh, 3808. It says, learn the recitation, and this is the prophet speaking, of the Quran from four, from Abdullah bin Masud. He stated with him, Salim, the freed slave, Abu uh, Hujhaifa, uh, Muyad, uh, Muyad bin Yabal, and Uba ibn Kaab. Uh, these are the four, he says, that you can, you can go to them and ask what the Prophet said. They have memorized it perfectly. Well, there's a problem. Because when Ibn Masud, uh, the first on Muhammad's list, when he hears and when he looks at the standardized Quran, he says, here's a problem. It's got 114 surahs. But we all know that there's only 111. So something must have crept in. What's going on? So we can see quite clearly that, um, you know, he makes the following claim. He says chapter 1, uh, well, uh, uh, Surah 1 and Surah 113 uh, and Surah 114 should not have been in the Quran immediately from the onslaught. Uh, this supposed revelator that Muhammad says, ask him, he knows everything puts up his hand, he says, these three should not be in the Quran. So because of this, uh, Ibn Masud, um, you know, uh, even goes far. And this is what Ibn Masud says when he looks at the Quran uh, and the compilation that is now reestablished. Uh, he says the following, and this is recorded obviously by Ibn Sa'd uh, in volume 2, page uh, 444. Listen to what this one says about this new revelation. He says, the people have been guilty of deceit in the reading of the Quran. I like it better to read according to the recitation of Muhammad, whom I love more than said even Tabit. So what is he saying? He's saying this new standardized Quran is deception. That's not what the Prophet has said. Uh, and that is clearly in the Muslim sources itself. Um, so, so not surprisingly, we can see quite clearly that uh, it is he, he then uh, rejects uh, Zaid's Quran and he keeps his own version. Uh, even to the point where he hides it from the Islamic government. Uh, and Jal Tirmidhi uh, records in 3104 uh, that, you know, uh, he, he renounces and he tells the Ummah the following, O Muslim people, avoid copying the Mushaf and the recitation of this man, Zaid's Quran. Uh, 
meaning Zayd bin Tabit. And it was regarded that this Abdullah ibn Masud said, O people of all Iraq, keep the, uh, uh, the Musaif that are with you and conceal them. So he's saying, don't give over your Qurans to be burned and get the standardized copy. There's something wrong with that standardized copy. Well, Muhammad already afforded authority to, to this individual that is denouncing the very Quran that have been standardized. Very interesting. Uh, but was it only uh, Ibn Masud that had a grievance against this? Unfortunately not. Uh, one of Muhammad's trusted teachers who disagreed was, uh, with Zayd's Quran uh, is Uba Ibn Kaab. So the last one mentioned on the list that Muhammad says, you can listen to him. If you listen to him, his revelation is utmost and it's authoritative. Um, in actual fact, Umar ibn Kaab was Muhammad's best reciter and one of the only Muslims to collect the materials of the Quran during Muhammad's lifetime. When we read the hadith correctly, we can see quite clearly that there was one that collected, uh, in writing at least, uh, what Muhammad had said, and that was Uba ibn Kaab. Uh, and so, uh, even Ibn Kaab believed that Zaid's Quran was missing two chapters. Uh, and listen to this, uh, and he, he calls for the rejection, obviously, of Ibn Kaab's recitation. Uh, and again, uh, we can see quite clearly there's this disgruntledness in the recitation. Uh, and the Hadith accounts quite clearly that there is a problem in understanding uh, this recension and revision of the Quran uh, very early by two top scholars uh, that even Muhammad is commenting on being authoritative. Uh, they say themselves there is some problems. Uh, okay, some of the hadith also shows us quite clearly that there is some missing chapters, uh, simply showing the facts about the Quran and, and its perfect preservation as we hear from Muslims. Uh, does not denounce the fact that they need to account for the hadith, stating quite clearly that there is some problems within the hadith uh, or in the Quran and its recension. Uh, and listen to this from the hadith itself. Uh, it says the following. It says, uh, Ubay, uh, Ubayt in his kitab, uh, Fadil al-Quran, it says, When Ibn Umar, son of the second Muslim caliph, heard people declaring that they knew the entire Quran, he said to them, Let none of you say, I've learned the whole of the Quran. For how does he know what the whole of the Quran is? When much of it has disappeared, let him rather say, I've learned what is extent thereof. So here a Muslim is saying to people that, that profess, we know all of the Quran. No, no, you don't know all of the Quran. There are certain elements and certain chapters that are missing. Uh, what about those uh, recitations that were lost at the day of Yamama uh, and the battle that took place there? Don't say you know everything. It is missing. Okay. So, one of the Muhammad's companions, Abu Musa, supposedly claimed this when he said that the earliest Muslims forgot two chapters or two surahs due to their laziness. Now listen, I'm going to read to you from Sai Muslim. Now remember, this is Sai, so it's authoritative. Abu Musa al-Ash'ashri sent for the reciters of Basra. They came to him and they were 300 in number. They recited the Quran and he said, You are the best among the inhabitants of Basra. For you are the reciters amongst them, so continue to recite it. But bear in mind that you reciting for a long time may not harden your hearts as were hardened by the hearts of those before you. We used to recite a surah which resembled in length the severity to surah Barat. I have, however, forgotten it with the exception of this which I remember out of it. And then he quotes the portion that he could remember. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the sons of Adam but dust. And we used to recite a surah which resembled this one of the surahs after Musa, uh, the Musa uh, Biat, and I have forgotten it. So here a, a, a very prominent figure in Islam uh, is showing us that a whole chapter in the Quran is missing. He says, remember we recited this uh, and I don't know where it is. It's not in the Quran, but it's not there anymore. So there's missing chapters and listen to this. There's missing passages. Uh, we go just even a little bit further. Uh, and the wife of Muhammad Aisha, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, she mentions Surah 33 and she says that two-thirds of Surah 33 uh, is simply lost. Uh, and let me quote to you from the Hadith uh, where she says the following. She says, Aisha said, Surah Al-Azab, 
uh, used to be recited in the time of the prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was enabled to procure more uh, of it than there is today. In other words, 73 verses. So there's a plentitude of verses that is just lost in Surah 33. So according to Aisha, the collections uh, that is uh, collected by, uh, uh, by Umar uh, or by Uthman, uh, in actual fact, is absolutely lost. Uh, this collection does not hold the passage that is thought of to be in the Quran. Uh, in another uh, uh, hadith, we see that there is missing verses. Now this, um, this, this is the, the uh, funny one, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Uh, Aisha also tells um, you know, that this specific verse was missing in this way. So Sunan Ibn Majad in, in 1944 states the following. It was narrated by Aisha when she said, The verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. But when the messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in, and he ate it. Have you ever heard the dog ate my breakfast? Well, this sheep ate this Quranic revelation that was supposedly written down. Uh, and let me just say, I'm not going into the death of the verse of stoning and breastfeeding, um, you know, but it's interesting to note that this whole chapter is lost uh, because uh, a sheep ate it. Okay, missing phrases from, uh, phrases from the Quran. Uh, we can see already that there's missing chapters, there's missing uh, portions, uh, there's individual verses that are missing in the Quran, uh, and there are some uh, recensions and some of the revelations that were forgotten as well. Um, we can see quite clearly, um, you know, that you know that that Muhammad even of and in of himself had trouble sometimes, uh, you know, to to. To remember some of these revelations or words. So he would give, for instance, a revelation and later on he will say, what did I say again in that revelation? Uh, and he could not remember. Uh, and, you know, in and of itself, we can see quite clearly that, um, you know, this is problematic because if you forget what God has told you, if not written it down, uh, isn't it incumbent upon God then to recall it because you said in, in Surah 59 that, that God will preserve his revelation. Um, so it seems that Muslims have been left with an incomplete revelation and there are numerous instances where some of these passages, verses, lines and even uh, specific uh, chapters were interpolated into the Quran which should have never been there. Um, so we can see quite clearly that when Muslims make the call or when they say that evidence shows that the Quran have been perfectly preserved, we should tell them it's simply not true. And we can use their own sources to show them quite emphatically and clearly uh, that uh, even some of the best recenters or even reciters of the Quran uh, supposedly forgot uh, some of the chapters, uh, misplaced some of these revelations, and ultimately lost what was said by the Prophet. Okay, so this raises an obvious question. What is the difference between a book that is perfectly preserved uh, and one that has not been perfectly preserved. Now, this should be fairly obvious, but we can see quite clearly uh, that uh, when we look at the Quran in and of itself, that which is told to, to people as a common community, uh, we don't see this in the reality of the recension of the Quran. Uh, scholar David Stewart, in an essay on medieval and uh, modern emendations of the Quran, uh, summarizes in one paragraph some of the main problems with the textual transmission of the Quran. And let me read this to you because this is the point that we need to get to when we speak to Muslims sincerely about the Quranic revelation itself. David says the following, he says, The Quran is open to the same types of copyist errors and problems of transmission that occur in other works handed down by humans, including sacred texts. The state of the text itself demands emendation, and in the absence of early manuscripts, conjectural emendation must play an important role in this process. The common argument from Muslims that an uninterrupted and complete reliable oral transmission has miraculously preserved the text of the Quran from such errors falls flat. Okay? Uh, and again, like I said, there are numerous books being released and written right now that shows that the earliest understanding and the earliest manuscript evidence that we have for Islam 
points to this, that there is no true preservation as Muslims supposed. The tradition of Quranic recitation can be shown to ignore or run roughshod over many discernible and retrievable features of the text, particularly with regard to rhyme that must represent the older stages in its performance. In addition, while many of the variants recognized as legitimate within Islamic tradition may plausibly have arisen through oral transmission, many others cannot, being based on the graphic and not phonic resemblance. One may also point out Quranic passages where the received text does not make sufficient sense and an apt emendation can provide a superior reading. What is David getting at? Uh, just uh, as a bit of homework, I did a recent interview with a scholar in America. Uh, you can find it on the SATS YouTube channel. Uh, and we looked at the earliest uh, Quranic um, recension under Uthman. And uh, he shows exactly what is wrong with the revelation of the Quran. When we look at contextual emudation, when we look at the, 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 the transmissional history, when we look at the razam, which is the little dots and thickles in the Quranic text, and he shows quite clearly that there is huge difficulties in interpreting the Quran according to those different systems. So it's not just passages that are missing. It's not just revelations that are foreign or gone. It is ultimately the revelation in and of itself in the manuscripts that in actual fact is problematic. I know. Could you please repeat the name of the person? Uh, his name is Louis Dizon. Louis Dizon. And if you go to the SATS YouTube channel... L-U-I-S, Lewis. Yeah, well, he says Lewis. He's maybe just being classy. In South Africa, we'll say Louis. Uh, <laughs> Louis Dizon, D-I-Z-O-N, Z-O-N, not Z, hey. Uh, have a look at that. Very interesting interview and absolutely something worth watching. Excellent. Okay, so earlier I said we will go into the Medinian period of the prophetic uh, ministry of Muhammad, which is about 622 to 632. Uh, and uh, we can see quite clearly at this stage of the prophetic, uh, the, pr the prophet's life, uh, he formed different alliances with various non-Muslim groups. Uh, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, Muhammad began uh, robbing the Meccan caravans. Uh, these attacks eventually led to a series of, of battles with the people in Mecca. Uh, and let me just say it was a way of life for the people of the desert. Muhammad was very much a man of his time. Uh, and we can see that uh, Muhammad then obviously allowed his army to subdue Mecca uh, and the rest of Arabia as well. And then in 632, there's a huge thing that um, you can speak about when it comes to uh, Muhammad's death. A lot of people believed he was, was poisoned. Early in his revelation, he makes a statement in some of the hadith that if I am a false prophet, may God cut you know, my life from me. And that is exactly what happens when he dies of poisoning. He tells uh, his wife Aisha, it feels like somebody cut my life from me, which is just interesting. Not going to go into that today, but uh, we can see that in about 632, uh, it's believed that he was poisoned by a Jewish woman uh, who, uh, yeah, I know, uh, what do you, what do you, Daisy de Malker? Uh, in South African context, Black Widow, you know, but yes, he, he was poisoned and obviously uh, he died a, a, a gruesome death, a painful death in 632. He obviously left no succession, obviously it was up to the tribes to fend for themselves. But let's quickly look at the life of the Prophet and what uh, these accounts reveal, especially the hadith about the Prophet of Islam. Now I've said to you before, I'm going to look at the good, and then we're going to look at the bad, and then we're going to look at the ugly. Um, for the sake of the ladies in the classroom, I'm not going to go into detail uh, of the bad because it really is bad. Um, and I am just too embarrassed to go deeply into uh, you know, some of the things that, that a lot of people will say. But I think what we will look at will be adequate and I think it will give you some proximity as to what we can believe about the Prophet of Islam. Now when you speak to a Muslim, uh, it's good for them to understand that you looked at Muhammad in a very balanced perspective. Uh, and you can speak about the good uh, and his contribution and his legacy. Uh, nobody's right mind will just follow a vigilante that is a homicidal maniac. And that's usually how Christian apologists, uh, you know, portray him. You know, he was off the cuff and he was uncontrollable. And no, no, he had certain virtues that we need to look at. Okay. So here are some of the things that we can look at that I will call the good. Uh, Muhammad was definitely a man of his time. 
That being said, this is a double-edged sword. When we look at Muhammad specifically, uh, no one can study the life of Muhammad without being impressed uh, with his rise to fame. Uh, he was a mere citizen of Mecca, uh, and he became an undisputed leader of the Arab world uh, throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Okay. Um, again, like I said, uh, his historical, uh, you know, general historical uh, life, uh, as it is transcribed, is is virtually unknown uh, unless you draw upon the later written. Uh, 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 historical events that we find within the Hadith and other collections, uh, but we can see quite clearly uh, that Muhammad was very much a man ingrained in his time and amongst his people. Um, and when we look at him, he has to be assessed from a religious spell uh, as well as a historical viewpoint uh, that is faithful uh, to the time and the day to which he is uh, measured. Uh, and that being said, if I say Muhammad is a man of his time, uh, if he's a timeless man, uh, and if he's the revelation for all mankind in all time, uh, in all places, this is problematic because his ideologies, his ethic, his understanding of women, his understanding of war, his understanding of revelation, his um, life as a whole, as we will see, does not always reflect a standard or morality that is higher than what we, for instance, find in the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Christian scriptures. Uh, my friend John Gilchrist uh, therefore says the following, and I want to read this because this is very good. He wrote a book, by the way, that will be here tomorrow if you want to purchase it. Um, I asked uh, John and he says it's fine. Uh, John Gilchrist will bring some of his books with that you guys can purchase if you want it. So bring some money. Uh, he's got very good books. Can you bring cash? Yeah, bring cash please. How much? Uh, Thousand rand each? No, I'm just teasing. No, uh, no his books uh, are very reasonably priced. He usually only covers his uh, printing cost. So I think the, the most expensive will be about 150. It's a thick book. Uh, his shorter uh, books will be about 60 and 70 rand. But bring it. He wrote a book on Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, which I think is a must read for all of us. Uh, and he says the following. Let me read to you. Uh, the Muslim world draws an absolute conclusion here without further ado, meaning that they look at the example of the prophet and they say Muhammad was the greatest of all prophets. In, indeed, Allah's universal messenger to all mankind, an example of all human conduct and behavior without reproach. He was sinless, though not without human failings, but irreproachable in his role as his choice representative on earth. This is for Allah. The Christian view, however, has been very different and has generally perceived him to be, on the one hand, a great leader and a reformer who led the, Ar uh, the Arabs out of pagan darkness, to the other extreme, namely that he was a demon-possessed imposter whose deliberate purpose was to lead the whole world astray, to darken the minds of millions of men from seeking the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are a number of ways in which Muhammad's prophetic course can be fairly assessed. He can be appraised purely on the merits of his own character. He can be evaluated in light of his reputation amongst the immediate contemporaries. And as a claimant to divine prophethood, he can be compared with Jesus Christ, the founder of the world, uh, the world's other universal monotheistic faith. So there's two views that we can have of Muhammad. But we need to start and say Muhammad was definitely a man for his time. Christians do not believe that Muhammad was a man for all time. Uh, Muslims will believe that this man was a perfect example, an exemplar for all human behavior in all time. Big difference. Number two, Muhammad did not deny that he was, uh, in actual fact, one that had faults. Uh, this is a positive aspect because when we look at, uh, for instance, some of the um, revelation that was given, uh, we can see in Surah 18 verse 2, there's a blind man that approaches Muhammad. Uh, he's a bit put off by this man and by his appearance. And he uh, shuns this blind man, uh, and it's his wife, Aisha, that confronts him. And uh, she confronts the fact that he has some faults in his character because he could not, in actual fact, um, look upon uh, this blind man. All through the Quran, we can see also there is Muhammad praying for forgiveness uh, before Allah, which tells us that the sentiment that he was sinless, uh, and also the isma, or the sinlessness of the prophets, it's not something that we see in its full reality when we reflect upon the Judeo-Christian scriptures and also upon the life of Muhammad in later hadith. So yes, Muhammad uh, uh, obviously even in the Quran stipulates that he had many faults uh, even in his old 
or in his own life. Uh, he believed, and this is Muhammad, quite sincerely that he was called by Allah to turn his people away from pagan distractions to the worship of the supreme being who is Allah. Uh, this is no, there's no doubt. When, when we look at the, and when we read the life of Muhammad, we find him uh, in places, for instance, early on when he tries to take his message to Mecca, we see that he is persecuted. We can see that there are numerous accusations um, that is uh, formed against him, uh, especially uh, with his journey uh, at Taif. Uh, it was perhaps the lowest point of his ministry, um, and uh, we can see quite clearly that he did experience certain persecution uh, for the message he tried to bring to the Meccan people. So yes, Muhammad in and of himself experienced uh, a lot of persecution if he was not sincere, we would say, well, he would have abandoned his course. He would say, I'm out of here, I don't need this. And he would just conform to the culture and to the Meccan people. But he did not. He stayed his course. He believed in his revelation. And he believed what he had to say was, in actual fact, to restore the people back to the one true faith before Allah. Uh, another point that is positive, the good, like I said, uh, is that he declared that he was nothing more than a human being. Uh, and he was nothing different than the messengers of Allah. Uh, who preceded him. Now, if you look at the revelation of Muhammad, you can see quite clearly uh, that he mentions and he draws upon a lot of the revelations given to the previous prophets. Uh, in his own estimation, uh, we can see, for instance, that uh, he was uh, concerned with himself uh, falling in line with all of these other prophets. Uh, and so in Surah 3, 144, um, in Surah 2557, uh, and Surah 7, 184, uh, we can see that he is looking at himself as a warner of truth amongst many that is trying to call his people back to the one true God. Um, and so uh, he sees himself in line of all of these other prophets which preceded him. Uh, another good is the simplicity of his life. Uh, this also communicates uh, the sincerity of his own life. Um, we note in all of his life and in, in his opposition uh, while he... Um, was uh, in Mecca. He lived a, lived a frugal life uh, and he continued to do so. Uh, even after his success, uh, we can see quite clearly as the all of uh, the Arabian Peninsula comes under his control, uh, to his death, he was a simple man. He used to sweep his own chambers. Uh, just meant his wife strained him well, but nevertheless. Uh, he did his own chores uh, and uh, he, he fit in with the life, the ordinary life of his companions. He was not exuberant. He was not a mega prophet or prophet number one, as we would see in today's news media. Um, yeah, so uh, again, he did not project uh, any pomp of uh, a king. He did not try to become a monarch, uh, even though uh, there were a lot of people that saw him as an enigmatic figure. He always maintained a high, simple life uh, in and of himself. That is good. It should be commended. Okay, uh, also, uh, maybe a last good is even in the religious realm, uh, there is uh, likewise a keen sense of the spirit of a man aware of his place in the keenest sense of things. What does it mean? It means that because he saw himself as an as a addition to the succession of the message of the prophets, he also knew that he was part of a greater whole. Uh, and when we read Surah 2, 135, 136, uh, we can see quite clearly that he believed he contributed to the pursuit of God as it was laid out to the prophets that succeeded him. Um, so, yeah, we can see uh, then uh, emphatically that Muhammad in and of himself looks upon himself as uh, one that uh, is fitting into the revelation of what Allah has decreed. He does not see himself in any way or form as different than the previous prophets. Uh, and obviously it's the Ummah. It's the people then that elevate him and give him a special place. Um, John Gilchrist writes the following, and I just want to say this. Those Christians who seek to degrade the prophet of Islam and demonize him in every possible way have never seriously tried to evaluate him in light of his own generation. Like I said, the prophet of Islam was very much a man of his time, but we should evaluate him also publicly, and we will do so uh, next. John also adds, he says, from any objective point of view, uh, he stands out as one of the giants in human history. But in the context of his own era, arising as he did out of an obscure wasteland of Arabia, uh, at a time when virtually no attention was given to this part of the world, 
uh, he was to be acknowledged as a truly remarkable man. No Christian will be able to really understand what motivates the dedicated faith of hundreds of millions of Muslims in the world to this day unless he first discerns the impact that the personality of Muhammad himself had on the earliest generation of believers. It will be appropriated at this point to see precisely how his contemporary followers saw, in, saw him in light of their own daily interactions in all spheres and areas of life. It's important to notice that he made a huge contribution to what was known as pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, and therefore we should also acknowledge that as Christians. Now, the bad, his fallible character. I've just mentioned a few, and, and trust me, uh, if you go to my website, there's a, a little booklet called Consider Islam. There's a quick synopsis on why I'm not a Muslim, and some of the ideas that is mentioned uh, where uh, there are certain accusations leveled against Muhammad, you are welcome to look at it. Uh, him being married uh, to his child bride Aisha at the age of nine, him cons consummating the marriage, uh, little things like that which is obscure, uh, but it was definitely something acceptable at that time. Uh, him having a multiple or plethora of wives, uh, him being polygamous, uh, is something very much indicative of the time. Him being a caravan robber, it was something everybody did in the time. So like I said, Muhammad was very much a man of his time. But there are certain elements and certain things uh, that will make your blood run cold. And when you read some of the, uh, some of the stories of the Prophet uh, and his fallible character, um, we can see, for instance, that Muhammad uh, is uh, one that vetoes and commands his followers to kill critics of what he's delivered. Uh, in one instance, a man named Abu Afhaq was more than 100 years old when he decided to write a poem about Muhammad. Um, and in this poem, he is obviously criticizing the revelation and the prophet. Uh, and uh, then Muhammad sent some of his men to assassinate him. Uh, and the account is given. It says that they deceived him. Uh, and uh, what they've then done is uh, they take him uh, and they kill him. And Ibn Ishaq uh, in his Sirat Rasul Allah, the book that I've mentioned on page 675, relates uh, how uh, the companions of the prophet is zealous to kill this man just for the words that he uttered against the Prophet. Uh, and that is something that was vetoed, obviously, uh, by Muhammad himself. Um, and now we understand, if Muhammad is the perfect example, uh, and I don't want to go off point, but now we understand why certain individuals believe in the name of Allah, if you draw a cartoon of the Prophet, or if you say anything false against the Prophet, if he's the example and he vetoed it, what can we do? We can do the same. So it's sort of in conflict with some of the models and standards that is presumably laid out by the Ummah or the community today and what we see effectively in the life of the Prophet of Muhammad as well. Uh, in Sunan Abu Dawood in 448, uh, we can see that a blind man uh, is also um, one that have disparaged or even uh, have spoken out against the Prophet. And uh, again, you know, uh, we can see a lady also speaks out, Jewish lady uh, rebukes and speaks out against Muhammad. And one night she began to slander the Prophet and abuse him. So he, this man took a dagger, placed it on a belly and pressed it and killed her. Uh, and then they go to the prophet and they say, this man during the night, lady said something bad. He took this dagger, he pressed it upon her and he killed her. And it says, thereupon the prophet said, oh be witness, no retaliation is payable for her blood. So what she's done is vetoed, it is seen as good and innocent is slaughtered. Uh, all these different stories show us quite clearly that the apostle was ready uh, in killing and assassinating people that were standing against his revelation. That's just one of the uh, accounts that is given. Uh, another account that is given is that the prophet once ordered his followers to torture a man for the money that he possessed. Uh, we can see that the apostle, uh, and this is uh, obviously mentioned in uh, Ibn Ishaq on page 515, it says the apostle gave orders that a Jewish man who they knew he had some treasure uh, near a rune and they were to excavate the rune, they excavated the rune, they found some treasure but there was still some treasure short. So the apostle gave the orders to uh, al Zubay uh, Awam, uh, torture him until you extort what he has. So here the apostle tells one of his companions to torture this man until they get the rest of the booty. Uh, and uh, he does so, obviously, it says, so he kindled the fire with a flint and steel, and he put it on the man's chest until he was nearly dead. And then the apostle delivered him to Muhammad uh, and, and struck off his head in revenge for his brother Mahmoud. Uh, 
um, obviously violence and use and intimidation uh, used just to, to do the bidding of the prophet. There's another instance, for instance, where the prophet uh, vetoes an assassination and again, someone is deceived uh, and he's told that, that they want to buy something, they, they want to come close to smell his perfume and when they come close to him, they, they kill him for the sake of the prophet. That is uh, Kaib ibn Ashaf, uh, a Jew who was resident in Medina, uh, who had uh, long been, uh, according to the Hadith, a nuisance to the prophet, uh, speaking out against him uh, and speaking verses out against the prophet in and of himself. Um, and it is accounted uh, that Muhammad's reception um, is then of these individuals that assassinate this Jew when they draw close and they kill him. Uh, listen to this. Uh, when they reached the apostle of Allah, Allah bless, uh, blessed him and he said, um, your faces be lucky. They said, yours too, O apostle of Allah. They cast the man, the guy that killed the cut off his head, they cast his head before him. He, the prophet, praised Allah on him being slain. And when it was morning, he said, kill every Jew whom you come across. The Jews were frightened, so none of them came out, nor did they speak. They were afraid that they would be suddenly attacked, as Ibn Ashaf was attacked in the night. So we can see quite clearly that Muhammad's attitude now is changing towards the Jews. First of all, he tried to win the Jews. He said, hey, I mentioned in your scriptures. Look at what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18. Look at what he said in Songs of Solomon 8. He's speaking about me. And the Jews said, no way, it's not you, man. And now what do we find? Well, we find that he now turns and he becomes violent against some of the Jews. Uh, also the Christians, uh, we can see quite clearly uh, that some of them were accepted, but some of them were also persecuted. How were they persecuted? Well, in some Jewish uh, and Christian cities, if it was overran by Islam, they would have to pay a jizya tax or a, a tax to be a Christian. They were not allowed to erect churches. They were not allowed to freely practice their religion or to proselytize. Uh, they were only allowed to survive if they paid some contribution towards the Muslim Ummah. Uh, so that is still practiced in some Muslim countries today. Uh, the jizya is a tax that is um, uh, impressed upon dhimmis of the faith, or dhimmitude is something that is widely practiced in Islam because of the Prophet's influence. So that is some of the bad, and like I said, for the sake of respect, I'm not going to repeat some of um, the rest of the claims that you can find in the life of the Prophet. It's just too bad. I'm going to be honest, but you're welcome to have a look. I've compiled a little reading uh, Islam on Islam. You can download it for free from our website. And you can read some of the instances of this. Okay, so how do, we prof how do we evaluate the prophet? And this is very important. Because ultimately, if we, uh, if we want to minister to Muslims, we're going to have to deal with the prophet. Uh, and we're going to have to speak about the prophet. And we're going to have to show that the prophet was a man of his time, that he definitely brought certain constitutes to pre-Islamic Arabia, which transformed the Arabian Peninsula and had a good influence on some of the Arabic people. But Muhammad cannot be allowed to escape any form of analysis biblically. Uh, obviously, he projected himself to be the universal messenger to all of mankind. Um, and again, when we read in Surah 34 verse 28 or Ayah 28, he makes it absolutely emphatic that he is the example for all mankind. Um, so uh, again, when we look at uh, this uh, or these claims of the Prophet, uh, they are claims uh, to universal leadership and example. Um, and in making them, we should judge him by absolute standards as he required. Um, in, again, uh, it's fascinating, but in Sal Muslim, Volume 4, that's about page 1260, uh, uh, this is what the apostles say about himself and Jesus Christ. Uh, Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, as saying, I'm most akin to Jesus Christ among the whole of mankind. And all the prophets are of different mothers, but belong to one religion, and no prophet was raised between me and Jesus. Well, in doing so, in relating himself uh, to uh, and matching himself to claims uh, like somebody like Jesus Christ, um, you know, he in actual effect invite a judgment uh, by the most precise standards that we would attribute or give to Jesus Christ himself. So, what is the life of Jesus Christ and Muhammad like if you compare the two? Uh, if the prophet of Islam is to be judged by the standards of his own time, um, we can see quite clearly in human history that he was definitely uh, not one that was deemed to be perfect. He was obviously one that had some failings of morality. He had some doubtful um, 
things that happened in his life and in his practice, uh, you know, that we can see quite clearly was incumbent upon uh, what we would deem to be uh, uh, tenets of a false prophet. Uh, but when we look at, you know, the life of Muhammad, uh, we only have Jesus as the perfect standard to measure him by. Uh, and so uh, when we look at, for instance, uh, Muhammad's announcement in Surah 930, where he calls that all Jews should be cursed and that there should be a curse on all of the Jews, um, you know, we can see Jesus, for instance, speaking in Luke 9.55, and he says, um, you know, uh, Jesus speaks to the Jews and he says, you don't know what type of manner you are speaking of. The Son of Man came not to destroy men, but to save men, not to condemn them. What about the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, 27, 28, where he says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. Well, Muhammad, uh, to his critics, he called for the imminent deaths and assassination, uh, which tells us that Jesus obviously displayed a higher form of ideology. Okay, uh, also uh, we can see that uh, when uh, we look at the Hadith, there's a woman that comes to Muhammad and she says, Prophet, I've committed adultery, what should happen to me? And he says, go away, go have your child and come back. And she goes and she has her child and she comes back. And then the Prophet says, stone her and they kill her. What about Jesus in John 8, uh, where the woman caught in adultery is, is brought before him uh, and he starts writing on the ground, he starts setting her free. And when he looks up, nobody's there to condemn her. Jesus just displayed a higher ideology and a higher ideal than what we see in the life of Muhammad. And there's just simply no comparison made. And when we look at the, uh, the understanding from the Muslim Ummah that this Muhammad is seen as this perfect teacher. Perfect according to what standards? Definitely not perfect according to the biblical standards and imperatives. When we look about what is happening in Islam today, the ugly, uh, I said the good, the bad and the ugly, we can see quite clearly uh, that the life of Muhammad uh, gives a lot of bearing upon a lot of the violence through Islamic extremism that we observe today. The reason people can do it is because they ultimately believe that Muhammad is Sha'afat. He is the perfect example. He's the one to be followed. And therefore, it is pretty open to violence when we see a student decapitating his teacher for saying something derogatory about the Prophet. Or the Charlie Hebdo incident, which, trust me, Charlie Hebdo in and of itself, don't watch their cartoons, it's abhorrent. But still, there is no freedom of speech because Muslims entered into the building and in the name of Allah killed a few journalists because they dared to say something about the Prophet and draw a little cartoon. Uh, why is all of these things done? Well, it's because the Rasul Allah, the Prophet of Islam, is seen as a perfect example. And then nobody that or anybody that does not follow this pattern uh, is not really seen as truly belonging to his teaching um, so the question that we should ask and we will look at this again on thursday when we look at jihad we will ask the question where do muslims get the understanding and, and let me say this not all muslims are fundamentally evil okay they follow an estimation of the prophet which have been constructed and venerated and have been not made completely whole from its context from which it's birthed. But when we look at the prophet in and of itself, uh, they should imitate his actions. Uh, they'll speak of his fi'il, uh, his words, his qual, uh, and the tacit approval of his deeds. That's spoken of his takrir. Now, if you follow the words and if you follow the, the approval and the deeds of the prophet um, who did all these bad things, uh, and again, there were some good things, but what about the bad things, okay? And here's the interesting thing. Uh, in Islamic estimation of sin and salvation, there's a huge difference. I had a conversation, you can have a look online uh, with a friend of mine, Muslim friend of mine, Bashir Vaniya, and we spoke about the concept of sin and salvation in Christianity and Islam. For the Muslim, that which is declared to be um, an abhorrence, or we would say that which is declared to be um, sinful is that which Allah declares to be sinful. So eating pork is sinful because Allah said so. It is therefore haram. But that which is declared halal, even if it's morally apprehensible, because Allah declared it to be halal, it can be done and it's not seen as sinful. 
So there's a very good difference between the way in which Muslims esteem and, and even attribute sin and, and salvation and that which is right and allowed and that which is not allowed in their system. But when it comes to Islam, we can see that Muhammad, because he's the perfect intercessor, we can see quite clearly that, um, and it's fascinating when you read Surah 32, 4, um, we can see that, that Muhammad gives this revelation, and it's fascinating that he gives this revelation, and he says the following to the Ummah, he says, you have no one besides him, this is Muhammad himself, to protect or intercede, and you will not then receive admonition. Um, so, it was already seen in the Quran as being, you know, of a good stature to call upon the Prophet to even intercede in certain circumstances. Uh, in Surah 2 verse 255, uh, it says the following, His are all things in the heavens and on the earth. Who is there that can intercede for His presence unless He allows it? So, the author of the Quran is already making some way saying, hey, there, there is someone that can be allowed to intercede for you, the Ummah upon earth, but Allah needs to allow it. And who did Allah allow? Well, the Holy Prophet. And we can see this in Surah 43, 86. It says, and those whom they call on besides Allah have no power of intercession except him who bears witness to the truth as they are aware. Who's the one that bared, uh, who, who bore uh, uh, witness to the truth? That is Rasul Allah, that is the Prophet of Islam. So it is quite obvious that when we look at the Prophet of Islam, we can see quite clearly that he's called upon as an intermediary. For Christians, obviously it's Christ. We, we have a complete intermediary before God, man, the man, Christ Jesus. Abu Dawood, uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, in volume 3, uh, this is page 1421, uh, Abba Musa reported the Apostle of Allah uh, and he, say, he says, Make intercession to me, this is Muhammad speaking, and you will be rewarded, for Allah decrees what he wishes by the tongue of his prophet. Meaning that Muslims have an intermediary to Allah, uh, which is the prophet himself. A little bit later in volume 3, uh, a little bit earlier actually, in, on page 1326 uh, in volume 3, Anas bin Malik reported the prophet, as saying, my intercession will be for my people who have committed major sins. So we can see that Muhammad is seen as this figure that can be drawn upon for blessings, barakah, uh, when it comes and he is the intermediary, intermediary before Allah. So uh, we can see quite clearly that Allah favors the Prophet and because he favors the Prophet, the Prophet is esteemed and he becomes a central person and a central figure to the hopes, the desires, the convictions, and the yearnings of the average Muslim. You know, I could never understand how can Muslims not take any offense when I speak about Allah and the problems that I see in the theology of Allah, but they say nothing when you say about anything about Allah. But the moment you speak about Muhammad, there is there's fire, there's, there's, some, there's some tension. Why is there? Because for them, uh, to get to Allah, the one that is standing before they can get to this proximity of the divine is Muhammad himself. And he should be venerated and uphold. Uh, and that is exactly where the premise of their devotion lies. Uh, early on, they were called Muhammadans uh, for a reason. Their religious life and constitute and their very devotion was deduced from this man, Muhammad. Uh, and it's very much so today. So just be aware, well, whenever you speak to Muslims about the Prophet, there might be a form of resistance. And the more you attack the Prophet, the more you lay it out. Listen, the first thing to do when you have a conversation with Muslims is not to speak about the moral imperatives that is void in the Prophet of Islam and his, age, his marriage and consummation to a nine-year-old little girl when you start a conversation with them. It's just not the way to do it if you want to reach them. Um, but when you start, show them what we've shared today. And I think this is what John will do with you tomorrow. He's going to show you quite clearly how you can introduce and how you can work with Muslims and how you can speak to them and how you can slowly show the inconsistencies that are evident in their religious constitutes and in this religious movement. Uh, I thank you. I've shared and I think I've stopped in the middle of wherever. But be blessed and see you again on Wednesday.